good evening all of you a warm welcome to the annual scientific session 2021 now i cordially invite prof niranga devanarayana president physiological society of sri lanka to give the introduction of the orator good evening welcome to the professor kala fonseca memorial oration 2021 Professor Carlo Fonseca was a man of many parts, a true polymath. He was an inspiring teacher of physiology and a public speaker, a physician, a political act- activist, a science writer, and a philosopher. What I admire most is his role as a teacher. I quote the words of Vidya Jyoti Professor Janaka De Silva, senior professor of medicine, Faculty of Medicine, University of Kalania. who delivered the Carlo Fonseca Memorial Lecture at the 30th Anniversary Academic Sessions of the Faculty of Medicine, University of Kalania. Professor Carlo was quite simply one of the best lecturers, if not the best I have ever listened to and I have been around. When teaching, he was good-natured and non-threatening. He never singled out students for ridicule. His lectures were simple, fluent, and entertaining. take home and message was very clear i still remember it word for word after 45 years in 1991 professor carlo took the huge challenge of establishing a new faculty of medicine for the university of kalania from the remnants of the north colombo medical college as the first dean of this medical faculty and first professor of physiology he faced challenge with wisdom and foresight and laid a firm foundation that enabled the department of physiology and the faculty to grow and develop along unique lines before he retired in 1997 today sitting in the same chair held by this giant i feel quite insignificant to honor this legendary physiologist the physiological society of sri lanka organizes annual carlo fonseca memorial oration starting from this year the inaugural carlo fonseca oration is delivered by Dr. Asoka Disanayake, former colleague of Professor Carlo, who succeeded to the Chair of Physiology, University of Kalani, after his retirement. Dr. Asoka Saratkumar Disanayake had his school education at Royal College of Colombo, then entered the University of Ceylon and obtained his MBBS degree in 1965 with second-class honors and distinction in physiology. He obtained his PhD in 1973 from the University of Oxford with his research work on pathogenesis of celiac disease. In 1968, he joined the University of Colombo and served initially as a lecturer and later as a senior lecturer in physiology until 1980. Subsequently, after several years of service in Middle East countries, Dr. Disanayake joined the newly established medical faculty of University of Kalania. as an associate professor he was appointed to the chair professor of physiology in 1998 the computer center of the faculty of medicine and the gastroenterology research laboratory he pioneered to establish during his tenure as the chair professor of phys- physiology has now developed into centers well recognized locally and internationally now after 18 years uh, of his retirement from university of kalania Dr. Asoka Disanayake again shared his, his knowledge and experience with medical undergraduates at the Faculty of Medicine, Vyabha University of Sri Lanka, as a visiting fellow. Dr. Disanayake always had a special affinity towards medical edu- education. He chaired the Medical Education Committee uh, of faculty for many years and initiated the curriculum reforms, which ultimately led to the integrated curriculum accepted by most medical schools in the country his main research interest was in gastrointestinal physiology and he published more than 20 articles almost all are in in index journals i was fortunate enough to serve as a probationary lecturer under in the department of physiology under him i consider dr asoka disanak as my mentor and the role model His dedication as a teacher and a researcher inspired me to strive uh, to achieve my goals in academic career. It is my honor to invite Dr. Asoka Disanayake to deliver the inaugural Carlo Fonseca Memorial Oration at the 33rd Annual Scientific Sessions of the Physiological Society of Sri Lanka. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Professor Carlo. 
Sri Ranga Devanarayana, President of the Theological Society of Sri Lanka, members of the Executive Committee, Mrs. Pearl Fonseca, members of the family of the late Professor Fonseca, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a great pleasure and a privilege for me to have been invited to deliver the inaugural Professor Carla Fonseca Memorial Oration of the Physiological Society of Sri Lanka. The dilemma I faced was that already two memorial orations had been delivered about Professor Carla Fonseca. The first was by Professor Sarod Jai Singh, organized by the Department of Medical Humanities of the Faculty of Medicine, Colombo. And the second was by Professor Janaka de Silva at the 30th anniversary celebrations of the Faculty of Medicine, Kalania. In addition, <clears throat> Member of Parliament, Anura Kumar Visanayaka had made a speech concentrating on the political contributions of Professor Carlo Fonseca soon after his demise in September of 2019. Also, many contributions in memoriam had been made to the newspapers from time to time regarding Professor Carlo Fonseca. Now, Professor Fonseca was a single person who had turned down honorary degrees such as the DSC and also honors such as Vidya Jyoti, if I'm correct. And therefore, I'm sure he would not have wanted me to keep repeating the things that have been said over and over again and written to the newspapers. And there, that is why I have decided today on a topic which is somewhat different, but of current interest. The topic is of two parts. The first is my journey through three different countries and six universities teaching physiology, where on occasions I have met Professor Konseka and worked as his colleague. The second part is about my experiences with online teaching. But before I do so, do so let me <clears throat> try and concisely say what the qualities of Professor Fonseca were, in the words of firstly, Professor Ratnajeevan Poole, who in his uh, article to this Colombo Telegraph on the 5th of September, compared him with Isaac, Sir Isaac Newton and Reverend Ludwig. This was put more precisely by, by Professor Janaka de Silva, when he, in his oration, described Professor Carlo Fonseca, the far-sighted professor, as a modern-day polymath, a doctor, teacher, a public speaker, political activist, philosopher, musician, lyric writer. I first met Professor Carlo Fonseca when I joined the medical faculty of Colombo in 1968 along with Professor Colvin Gunratna, Lalit or Bobby Dias, Virlan Kumaran, and myself. Professor Fonseca took kindly to me because I hailed from the Dulapitiya area and he had known my wife from childhood. Uh, and we worked closely together now, the Department of Physiology at that time was very highly regarded, and the early 1970s were considered the golden era of the physiology department because of the quality of its teaching, which was dominated by Professor Bulchenigaratna, Moses Desaraja, and Carlo Fonseca, with contributions from Colleen Gunratna and Bobby Dias. This time period was still the chalk and talk era. The only assistance that lecturers had were the use of transparencies, which were projected via an overhead projector. As the slides first began to make their appearance in about the middle of the 1970s, and these were made with the help of the P 
people in the photography department of the Department of Pharmacology. Now, the Physiology Lecture Theatre, for those who are familiar with it, is very much like an amphitheater. And it lent itself well to the likes of Professor Fonseca, who was an iconic teacher. And you may have heard both from, if you listen to Professor Sarojaya Singer's like, uh, oration, where he quoted a single mnemonic coined by Professor Fonseca to describe the clotting cascade, and also the one described by Professor Janaka de Silva in his oration, describing the features of obstructive jaundice in Singhala. So he was well known for Singhala mnemonics. And you may wonder why Singhala mnemonics. This was because in the early 70s, we had to teach not only in English, but in Singhala and Tamil as well, because this was the first time that Singhala and Tamil educated Sobhasha students entered the faculty. And by law, it, it required us to teach them not only in English, but also to give lectures in parallel in Sobhasha. It was a difficult task for some of us, but for Professor Fonseca, it was a very simple matter. For he had been educated at Maristella up to the JSC level, the equivalent of standard eight in Singhala. You can also imagine what a monumental task it was to prepare question papers because these had to be translated in Singhala and Tamil and translating 60 multiple choice questions with 300 statements into Singhala or Tamil was no easy task. And then typing them on the old typewriters and rodeo thing on rodeo machines was an added problem. But that was what had to be done at that time. Now, when it came to 1975, these were difficult times in Sri Lanka and Professor Nes Dr. Nesaraj and I decided to leave the country. And so I said goodbye and went to Singapore where I stayed till 1979. From Singapore, I went on to the King Faisal University in Dammam, Saudi Arabia, where I spent almost 10 years, leaving Saudi just before the invasion of Kuwait by Saddam Hussein. While in Saudi Arabia, in nine, around 1984, Professor Carlo Fonseca was doing a sabbatical in Riyadh. And he visited me a couple of times, and I too visited him in Riyadh. It may be of interest to mention here that Professor Fonseca's daughter, Indunil, first met the young, handsome airline executive, Chandana de Silva, in Riyadh. And later he was to become her husband. From Saudi Arabia, I moved on to Sultan Qaboos University in Muscat, Oman. And after spending four years there, in two, 1995, I came out to Sri Lanka for good. And when Professor Fonseca met me, he invited me to join the Faculty of Medicine, University of Kalania. When I joined the University of Kalania, Professor Fonseca very kindly offered to give me some money from a slush fund he had from the days of the NCMC, and I was able to establish a GI physiology lab. And also we were able to establish a dedicated computer center for students use. The, in 2001, the NSF granted us an ultrasound machine to complete the GI physiology lab. And our president this year, Professor Devana Rana, was the first to use this ultrasound machine. And uh, she did an excellent amount of research with it and produced many good publications. And in addition to her, several others have done their postgraduate studies in this GI physiology lab. The computer center itself 
has become one of the best, I believe, in this country. In 2002, the urge to move again bit me and I resigned from my chair in Dragama and I went to live in a village. But before that, I should mention that in 1997, Professor Fonseca was invited to attend a medical education conference in Pattaya, Thailand, to which I also went because the department had a paper as an abstract, a paper which we presented. Now on the way back, of course, Professor Fonsek and I, who shared a room at Pattaya, also visited Bangkok, but I shall refrain from explaining <clears throat> what we did in Bangkok. You would also be interested to know that Professor Fonseca was one of the first to show an interest in medical education. While in Colombo in the early 70s, I believe he visited the University of Illinois Center for Medical Education run by Professor George Miller. This was one of the earliest centers which was involved with developing medical education even prior to the center in Dundee. And while Professor Fonseca didn't make much of a show about his knowledge of medical education, he was well versed in the various aspects of medical education and encouraged advances in medical education. However, as I said, I moved from Ragma in 2002 and moved to a remote village at the edge of the Gampa district to engage in coconut cultivation and not so successfully in dairy farming. This village was extremely remote and the picture on the left shows the state of the road to the village at the time I moved. And that was what it would look like today, even the weather conditions at this time of the year. However, the picture on the right shows you the village, uh, the road as it is now. And quite a few of you would have traversed this road when going to the faculty at Vaimba or to Anuradhapura. And some of you from places like Peradeniya may also have traversed this road, which is a good road to go to Katunayaka. The only drawback about this village today is that it is still a silent area as far as internet signals are concerned. Now, while living in this village, Professor Fonseca was kind enough to grace an occasion to declare open a building in the village school, which was a great occasion for the villagers, of course, who had heard of and read about Dr. Professor Fonseca. Also, I had not lost touch with the Physiological Society. And I believe during the period 2013, 2014, 2015, the Society very kindly asked me to be the quiz master for Professor Carlo Fonseca related challenge trophy for the Physiological Society quiz for medical students. And that kept my physiological knowledge not totally on disappearing. While I was there in 2018, around July, Professor Pia Lekanayaka, who was Vice Chancellor at Varma and the Registrar visited me and requested me to help with the new faculty at Varma, which had, was about to start. And so I agreed to help on a voluntary basis at my convenience, and I was appointed a visiting fellow of the Department of Physiology. And so the rest of my talk today will be on the experiences at Viamba with regard to online teaching. But before doing so, let me first describe a little bit about the medical school at Viamba, its program, and about the three intakes of students. The Viamba faculty 
program is semester based. And if I may go back a moment in time, I first came across course units, semester system, credit hours, grade point average, almost 30 years ago in 1980, when I was working in Saudi Arabia, long before it was introduced to Sri Lanka. The curriculum in Wyambar is semester-based. The first three semesters are devoted to the pre-clinical curriculum, as shown here. The second MBBS examination is conducted at the end of the third semester. The second MB examination is, however, subject-based, whereas the continuous assessments are integrated to a great extent. Though the questions themselves are individual questions, either anatomy, biochemistry, or physiology. Now, three batches of students are at present studying at the faculty. The first batch was admitted in 2018 with 71 students. The second batch with 74 students and the third batch with 134 students. I have had the honor of delivering the first introductory lecture in physiology to all three batches. To the first three batches, I have had the honor of delivering it on the 1st of January at 8 a.m. on 1st of January 2019 and the 1st of January 2020. However, for the third batch, it couldn't be done because of the COVID pandemic. Now, when the pandemic struck, the government ordered all schools and universities to close. And this necessitated certain changes in the instruction methodology. And here are the challenges and opportunities that the challenges we faced and the opportunities that arose. The challenges were to continue with the education process while minimizing disruption by using online remote learning. The opportunities were to evaluate the benefits and look at the shortcomings and plan for the new normal. And these are some of the things that I shall devote the rest of my oration to. Online medical education as described here is flexible learner-centered and can help students develop self-related directed learning skills. Medical education has changed very much in the last 20 years. Online learning in medical training extends beyond simply transfer of knowledge. It is thought that we can teach skills as well as attitudes. However, these two whether they can be taught successfully is questionable, and we will discuss this further as we go along. Now, online teaching, as opposed to traditional teaching, is thought to be able to deliver the latest evidence-based content to the learners. It can be instrumental in promoting self-directed learning because Online learning allows the learner control of what he or she learns. The learner can have greater control, therefore. At the same time, the teacher can evaluate competencies through online assessments, enabling learners to receive feedback. This, however, has been something that has been found wanting, particularly in the context of developing countries, especially ours. Finally, one has to remember that technology cannot replace pedagogy. Now, a little bit about our student groups and how the closure of the campuses affected them. This describes what happened to the first batch. As far as their second MB program was concerned, they were not really badly affected. It was the last exam of the semester examinations, that is the year two 
semester one, that's the final semester exam, was the one that could not be held. And therefore, those marks had to be transferred to the second MBBS examination, which was an in-person examination. However, their paraclinical program, which was the year two, semester two, was delayed. And therefore, their examination in the third year continuous tests were also held online. So their third year, semester one, and the year two, semester two, were all online teaching. So here was a batch which had their almost all their second MB program in person, but their third year program so far has been online. The next batch had the first year almost on in person, but part of it was online. Their examination, however, was done in person, but the continuous assessments could not be held. And a large percentage of the marks had to be transferred to the final second MD examination, which was an in-person examination. We don't have an analysis of these marks, but the indications are that the transfer of a large percentage of marks may have negatively impacted on their grades. The third batch were mostly taught online. And it was only their laboratory classes which were conducted in person. Both lectures and tutorials were done mostly online. Now, when we look at the use of appliances online, we found that for online learning, the first two batches tended to use a mix of appliances. There was no great difference between preferences for laptop or tablets or smartphones. Whereas in an Asian Development Bank study done across universities for students, 55% reported using laptops. Our numbers were 44 and 47% for the first two batches. However, interestingly, for the third batch, almost double the number reported using laptops. The question then is, did the word go around that using laptops was preferable to using smartphones? The Asian Development Bank study reported that when students use smartphones, they had problems that smartphone use was not conducive to reading all materials and completing assignments and quizzes. Though at Wyambo, we didn't use it for assignments and quizzes. Online access through smartphones was limited. So maybe that the word had got around that smartphones were not suitable for online use and students were now beginning to use laptops. Now, the next question we wanted to find out was how did online learning compare with in-person learning? We had the opportunity of doing a small study by looking at the outcomes of the in-person examination that the first batch faced, the second MBBS examination versus the online examination during the semesters of the third year and to compare these results. So this was the study design. The sample size was the entire third year, third year batch, 71 students. The first second MBBS was conducted in person. 
the third year first semester tutorials, lectures, and the examination were done on an online platform. And so the final marks at the second MBA examination were compared with the third year first semester online examination. When we looked at the results, we found that there was a significant reduction in the marks, average marks obtained between the second MBBS and the third year semester one continuous assessments. Now, what possible reasons can be adduced for this significant difference? We can only speculate. We don't have any hard evidence. Amongst the reasons could be that the online tutorials that were provided in the third year have reduced effectiveness compared to in-person tutorials because the tutor does not see the whole group at once. And therefore he or she cannot judge whether the students are really following what is happening in the tutorial. You only can see the picture of the student or sometimes not even the picture of the student, some sort of uh, picture that the student puts up to identify the picture with the ID number of the student. Secondly, there is a lack of feedback. Very often, only a small percentage of the students respond during the tutorial, unless you pointedly ask a question. And the third is the lack of peer support. It may be peer support from faculty, or it may be peer support from students, which goes by the popular term, Puppi. And uh, it is interesting to Recall that at a recent faculty board, it was discussed that the UJC is uh, thinking of formalizing a form of peer support for students. So these are some of the reasons we think that may have resulted in a significant reduction in the marks within the batch when they were examined, taught and examined in the online platform. We also thought of asking our colleagues in the TSSL about their ideas on online teaching. So we sent out a survey uh, to a questionnaire to find out their thoughts. 43% of the, those surveyed responded, which was not bad. I thought it was a little disappointing, but when we looked at the ADB study published in June last year, only 35% of the faculty members, quite a large number, I think a thousand odd, had responded, so it was not bad. 92% reported using laptops for their teaching, again, a comparable number to those in the ADB study. We did not ask about internet access, now, 57% use broadband in the ADB study, 43% use landlines. That, I believe, is determined by the location where you live. And from personal experience, I can tell you that in a place like where I live, we don't have landlines. Despite numerous requests to provide a landline connection to me, the SLT has failed to do so. And so I have a mobile connection which is pretty dodgy at times. 68% of the ADB survey suggested they have poor connections. Three or four members of the survey commented on poor internet connections. The lack of training was 17% in the ADB survey. Once again, the numbers are small, but some requested that <clears throat> they be provided with training in the use of technology. I'll come back to that at the end of my talk. Poor engagement for students was far less with the PSSL members than in the ADD study where it was significant, but this may be because the numbers, uh, these were medical students who are much more motivated than in the ADB study, which was across the board. And 
interestingly, in the ADB study, they found that students in the open university programs were far less conversant with online teaching and learning than others, despite the fact that on the open university concept itself calls for online learning. Now, amongst the other comments in the PSSL survey, 80, almost 83% use PowerPoint presentations via Zoom. The lecture duration varied between one or two hours, which is what we at Vibe also do. 82% delivered between one or two hour lectures per week. 65.5% reported modest student participation. If you look at the preferred mode of tutorials, two thirds used breakout rooms, while one third had the whole batch involved in a tutorial. When we looked at the respondents, it didn't seem to be that we could identify whether those using breakout rooms were from any particular university, while those who had a whole batch were from another particular university and whether this was dependent on the staffing ratios was difficult to identify. Similarly, when breakout rooms were used, the majority of breakout rooms consisted of around 25 to 35 students in a breakout room. If the numbers were more than about 35, I believe the numbers were not very manageable and it would be difficult because you would not be able to ask individual students questions. But the ideal would be under 25. When it came to practicals, 63% reported using virtual laboratory practicals. At Viamba, we deliberately did not do virtual practicals because we felt that they wouldn't satisfy our objectives. It was unclear whether the choice of doing or not doing virtual practicals as reported by the members was determined by the faculties or the individual members. When it came to the virtual practicals, most of them were video, video demonstrations and it is open to debate about the quality of the video demonstrations that could, could have been used. Now, this begs the question, are virtual physiology practicals effective for student learning? A study which is quoted here reports that virtual laboratories are effective for learning of concepts, but it is inconclusive as to whether virtual physiology laboratories are effective for teaching motivation of learning and technical skills. However, at the bottom, I quote another study, which you would be surprised to learn, comes from Rwanda. Now, Rwanda is considered a very underdeveloped African country, but this particular university is extremely well endowed because it is supported by some American universities. And this anatomy table that is used is a highly sophisticated software enabled simulation technology based innovation that is used, they claim, for teaching anatomy and physiology, including certain aspects of histology and embryology, comparative anatomy, and even pathology. They claim that they are able to successfully teach these practical classes and that they were able to seamlessly transfer from in-person teaching to an online based teaching program. After all, if you consider that today airline pilots are able to satisfy their licensing requirements by simulator training, and then are able to fly 
hundreds of people safely on aircraft. Why not? Train clinical as well as practical skills using high quality simulators if they can be developed, tested, and approved. Yet at the moment, not all basic skills can be included in an online setting. Many believe that virtual experiments do not allow to develop collaborative and hands-on technical skills, and that social interactions of group work are important as are in-person and synchronous sessions with the instructors where students can ask questions and clear up points of confusion. So there are doubts. Assessments online. We at Viamba were only possible to do assessments online for the first batch. For the third batch, it was not possible to do assessments online because of technical limitations. In the PSSL survey, only 37% said they conducted assessments online. A major drawback is the lack of experience and technical issues. And the medical faculties were suddenly tasked with doing assessments online, unlike some of the other faculties. A good example that I came across was the faculty of commerce and accountancy at the University of California. Now these faculties had been conducting paid courses online for many years. And so for them to do online examinations was a bit of a kick. And they were able to conduct these for even their regular students and also conduct online teaching sessions for people who are interested in online assessments. Unfortunately, it is sad to say, the UGC ha had not taken enough action to help the faculties develop online teaching and assessment programs. Now, what lessons can we take from our experiences towards the new normal? I gathered that the UGC Standing Committee on Mental and Dent Medical and Dental Education is exploring a new curriculum. And this table shows you what they have suggested. Very much similar to what has been going on. Now the green areas are those which I believe can readily be taught online. If you take the regular three subjects, anatomy, biochemistry, physiology, much of the 780 hours, the lectures and tutorials can be given online. It is the laboratory classes that may require in-person teaching. Hospital visits obviously have to be in person. So I believe that two thirds of the 1,120 hours could easily be done online. If that can be done, provided they are properly planned, the staff are well trained, then what would be the benefits and takeaways from our experiences? The cost of providing hostel accommodation entailed in, in this procedure would lead to a significant saving, not to mention the cost of usage of lecture halls, etc. So my idea is that blended learning would thus lead to substantial cost savings, allowing possibly for a further increase of students, provided that the other requirements are met, especially for clinical training. In the longer term, as is already being practiced in the West, a cost-effective way of completing clinical training 
is also possible using online methods. So to do so, the UGC will need firstly to ensure there is technical support by developing centers for teaching and learning, not the type of computer centers, the likes of which exist at Viber today. The UG should provide adequate training for the faculty in developing online teaching material, especially for practical classes and assessments. Allocate funds for the purchase of tried and tested teaching materials for teaching of laboratory skills and subsequently clinical skills. If that is done, we can. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, may I say of Professor Carlo, quoting from Professor Hull's article, mortals rejoice that there has existed such and so great an ornament of the human race. Thank you. My thanks go to all of those who helped me in this oration. Thank you very much, sir, for accepting our invitation to deliver the inaugural Professor Carlo Fonseca Memorial Oration for 2021, and also your wonderful lecture on medical education and for sharing your experience on teaching with us. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much for all of you who participated in our orations and scientific sessions. Now we have come to the end of our science annual annual scientific sessions. Good evening, everyone. This is the close of the annual scientific sessions 2021. Members of the Physiological Society of Sri Lanka, please join the annual general meeting using the link provided for you, which has been already circulated. For the closer of the session, we'll play the faculty song of the Faculty of Medicine, University of Calmia, the uh, lyrics, were provided by Professor Carlo Fonseca. Jesus.